In many cultures through history, eunuchs or castrated men have played significant cultural roles in societies. In China, and especially Imperial China, eunuchs were a pivotal component of the Imperial Court. But how did this practice come to be? What were their roles and how did they evolve throughout the ages? In this documentary, I'll explain the eunuch system in the history of China, its functions, prominent members, and eventually its demise. In ancient China, criminals were usually sentenced to one of five different penalties named the Five Punishments. These included the death sentence, amputation of various body parts, and castration. This last punishment, named Gong, was prescribed for people accused of crimes such as treason or adultery. Eunuchs were initially often used as slaves in the households of powerful families or as free labour in great construction projects, such as the immense mausoleum of China's first emperor, Xin Shi Huang. Their service in the court is described in ancient chronicles of the 8th century BC. It is however during the famous Han dynasty that their role truly became noteworthy. Oftentimes, eunuchs serving in the imperial court were young boys of barbarian peoples captured during campaigns in border territories. Once the conquest complete, local boys were castrated and brought to serve in the palace. As they could not have any children of their own and potentially found a rival family to the ruling one, nor get involved with the monarch's wives, they gradually became trusted servants who were appointed with administrative tasks. Before long, their presence in the palace became a normal sight. As the Han dynasty progressed, the power held by eunuchs and their influence on the emperors steadily grew, being appointed to stronger and stronger political positions. Around the 1st century AD, the first eunuch era began, as they started controlling many state affairs. During the decadent reign of Emperor Ling of Han, the first faction of eunuchs came to prominence. Although composed of 12 members, they were collectively known as the Ten Attendants. Along the years, during which the Han Dynasty was slowly crumbling, these eunuchs successfully ousted rival officials, including important generals and ministers, acquiring more and more power. They used their authority and influence to embezzle much wealth and strengthen their despotic position. The Ten Attendants' actions inevitably further destabilized state affairs, and contributed to the outbreak of the Yellow Turban Rebellion. In 189, Emperor Ling fell ill and died prematurely at 33 years old. He was succeeded by his 13-year-old son, Liu Bian, enthroned as Emperor Shao under the regency of General He Jin and Empress Dowager He, who were hostile to the eunuch faction. Trying to conserve their power, the Ten Attendants successfully assassinated He Jin shortly after. As a respected military leader, his death crystallized opposition to the eunuchs. In response, several warlords and generals stormed the palace and massacred all the eunuchs they could find, ending the rule of the Ten Attendants. These events however led tyrant Dong Zhuo to seize power as the Han Dynasty collapsed and the Three Kingdom era began. The first eunuch era was over. In the centuries that followed, as the nation broke into many quarrelling petty kingdoms and small dynasties, eunuchs would typically be granted little to no power, perhaps in the knowledge of the threats eunuch factions could present. In the 7th century, China was completely reunited under the glorious Tang dynasty, which also subjugated many neighbouring states. With the return of a large and powerful imperial court, eunuchs would make a comeback on the political scene. In 784, the command of one of its greatest armies, known as the Shan Jun, or Army of Divine Strategy, stationed in and around the capital of Chang'an, was granted entirely to court eunuchs. This military force was a foothold for them to gradually take control of the Tang court. During the 9th century, as Tang emperors gradually lost interest for state affairs, eunuchs were able to amass and conserve power. In late 835, after realising how much imperial authority had been lost to the eunuchs, Emperor Wanzong, assisted by his most trusted advisor, Chancellor Li Xun, and physician Zheng Zhu, plotted against them. 
In the aim of restoring the Tang dynasty to its glory days, they plan to first crush the eunuch faction by massacring them, before reclaiming lands lost to the Tibetan Empire and campaigning in the north. Perhaps in the hopes of keeping the glory to himself, Chancellor Li Xun decided to ignore the plan that was arranged and took the initiative. Taking the opportunity of a meeting where many eunuchs were assembled, he sent soldiers to assassinate them. The plan however failed, as according to a legend, a gust of wind blew open a gate, revealing the soldiers ready to take action. Subsequently, the eunuchs realized the trap and mostly managed to escape. After seizing Emperor Wanzong, they declared that Li Xun had rebelled and sent the Army of Divine Strategy under their control to slaughter Li Xun's forces, all his supporters and other officials unfavorable to them, in a great purge that claimed over 1,000 lives. Li Xun and Zheng Zhu were executed, and Emperor Wenzong lost all remaining power to the eunuchs. After this event, known as the Sweet Dew Incident, eunuchs freely selected each Tang Emperor's successor by issuing imperial edicts in the monarch's name, keeping complete control of the court. However, as the 9th century progressed, the country was torn by rebellions and infighting between eunuch factions, as well as military governors and warlords, and the Tang dynasty inevitably crumbled. The last powerful eunuchs of the imperial court were massacred in 903 by warlord Li Maozhen, but by then, the nation was so fragmented between other warlords that the dynasty only survived another four years, formally ending in 907. The second eunuch era was over. Much like after the Han Dynasty's collapse, eunuch authority after the end of the Tang was destroyed, as the country was torn between small states, an era known as the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms. This situation of civil war was the perfect opportunity for foreign invasions. As the Khitans expanded westwards, crushing northern Chinese states, they established their own Liao Dynasty. Although they did not traditionally practice castration, having their own traditions and customs. The Khitans did emasculate Han Chinese prisoners of war and captured young boys to serve in their imperial palace. These eunuchs were however essentially simple servants who did not hold influential positions. In parallel, the Song dynasty was able to emerge further south in 960, promptly conquering all on its path until becoming an immensely powerful state and main rival to the Khitan Liao dynasty. Its first monarch, Zhao Kuangyin, Emperor Taizu of Song, was well aware of the danger eunuchs could present to imperial authority. As such, he explicitly prohibited them from being appointed to important political positions. Nonetheless, important and powerful eunuchs would still emerge later on in the Song dynasty. Some, such as Zhou Huaizhong, even attempted coups without success. Others, such as Tongguan, were epitomes of loyalty to the Song Emperor. Tongguan was a eunuch who served as a trusted general-in-chief and counsellor to Emperor Huizong of Song, and was granted strong influence and titles due to his talent. In 1125, he was appointed command of Emperor Huizong's personal bodyguards when the Song had to flee in the face of the invading Jurchenjin dynasty, which had already defeated the Khitan Liao. Soon, a final foreign invasion of China would reunify and pacify the country for a while. From the steppes of Mongolia, the unstoppable Mongol horde crushed all states in its path, promptly establishing the Yuan dynasty that took control of all of China in 1279. However, they did not embrace Han customs as much as other foreign dynasties. During the rule of the Yuan, Eunuchs were mainly used as gifts in diplomatic contexts. Only a limited number of them served in the palace, and only for labor or in minor positions. Nonetheless, their number and influence would significantly increase as the Yuan dynasty was gradually Sinicized. A third eunuch era was yet to come for imperial China. The Han Chinese Ming dynasty, which overthrew the Mongols in 1368, was the era during which eunuchs became most prominent. Although its first two emperors, Hongwu and Jianwen, despised eunuchs and banned them from any position in politics, 
Such would not be the case for Zhu Di, the fourth son of Hong Wu. With the support of the neglected eunuchs, Zhu Di rebelled and seized power from his nephew, Emperor Jianwen, in 1402. He would become Emperor Yongle, third monarch of the Ming, and thereafter hold eunuchs in high regard. During his reign, Yongle sent trusted eunuchs on great expeditions to enrich and strengthen the Ming dynasty. The most famous of them, a captured Hui Muslim castrated as a child during the Ming conquest of Yunnan province, named Zheng He, would become a formidable admiral. After entering service under Emperor Yongle and distinguishing himself, he was given command of troops during Yongle's campaigns against Emperor Jianwen. Becoming a trusted advisor of the monarch, he was appointed to lead the Ming treasure expeditions, great naval explorations that eventually led him to East Africa. In parallel, Yi Xiha, a Jirchen eunuch serving Emperor Yongle, would be sent to lead expeditions down the Amo River to establish and strengthen relations with the Jirchen tribes within the Nuarkan Regional Military Commission. As Emperor Yongle's situation was initially unstable, he spent his early reign strengthening his political power and suppressing dissidents. For this purpose, he founded the Eastern Depot, an intelligence agency and secret police to monitor and spy on officials and the general public alike. It was entirely run and operated by eunuchs, planting the seeds of their influence in the Ming Dynasty's politics. Emperor Yongle's most formidable work was undoubtedly the construction of the Forbidden City in Beijing, which he declared the new capital of the empire. The colossal complex was largely designed by Nguyen An, a Vietnamese eunuch castrated during the Ming conquest of northern Vietnam. After 14 years of hard work, the Forbidden City was completed and operational in 1420. It would thereafter be the home of thousands of palace eunuchs, with roles ranging from low servants to powerful court officials. As Yongle trusted eunuchs, he planned to appoint many to prominent positions. The majority did however not have an education. The emperor therefore ordered the founding of the Inner School, an institution where they would learn to read and write and receive a general advanced education to prepare them for administrative tasks and artistic purposes. From then on, in addition to captured foreign eunuchs and eunuchs given as tributes, a great number of local Han Chinese were voluntarily castrated to serve in the palace, either as boys on their parents' decision or as adults. Motivation behind this choice was often material, as serving in the Ming Dynasty's Forbidden City guaranteed good living conditions and the possibility of distinguishing oneself, therefore making a fortune and acquiring significant political power. Although sometimes emasculated at home, candidates for eunuch service would typically go and see an expert castrator called Dao Zijiang, who charged a hefty sum for the procedure. The Dao Zijiang would in return ensure a smooth and professional operation and take medical care of his client's recovery in the weeks that followed. Once on the operating table, the specialist requested a final confirmation by the client that this was his wish before he would carry on with the castration. Using a specialized knife, the Dao Zijiang, assisted by his apprentices, would slice off the candidate's penis and testicles together in one or two clean cuts. The wounds were then tightly covered for three days, during which the candidate would not drink to prevent urination. After this intense trial, the bandages were removed. If the candidate was then able to urinate, it would prove that no blockage had taken place during the healing process, and his safety was practically guaranteed. Otherwise, he faced certain death, although this reportedly only occurred in about 1 in 50 candidates. After typically 3 to 4 months, the wounds had completely healed. New eunuchs could then apply for service in the palace, and if selected, would go through lengthy training under experienced eunuchs. Although they would live the rest of their lives emasculated, each eunuch aimed to be buried as a whole man. Their organs were therefore carefully preserved and placed in a receptacle with their name attached to it by the castrator. This object was used as a means to identify eunuchs in the palace and needed to be presented for promotions. It was not uncommon for some eunuchs to own fake receptacles had they lost their own. Tasks to which palace eunuchs were appointed 
range from secretary and administrative jobs to manual labour such as gardening or cooking. They also performed as musicians and dancers, in a large part to entertain imperial concubines in the harem, which they served and managed. As the Ming dynasty flourished, the number of eunuchs serving in the palace increased constantly, reaching dozens of thousands. Some eunuchs even began being privately employed by prominent families. The presence of powerful and influential eunuchs would lead to the Third Eunuch Era. As the young sons of Ming emperors were raised by eunuchs, they could ensure that the next emperor would be favourable to them, or even under their influence. In 1505, Following the death of his father Emperor Hongzhi, Prince Zhu Haozhao was enthroned as Emperor Zhangde at only 14 years old. Having been raised by eunuchs and spent all his life surrounded by them, he actually trusted them over court officials. Furthermore, it soon became clear that young Emperor Zhangde had no interest in politics, therefore entrusting eunuchs to manage state affairs. As a result, a group of eight eunuchs headed by one Liu Jin would rapidly take control of the nation, soon being nicknamed the Eight Tigers. Through their influence and blessings of the teenage emperor, they placed their supporters in important positions while purging their rivals, rapidly securing complete power in the Forbidden City, the secret police and even in the army. The following year in 1506, realising how despotic the situation was becoming, Prominent officials, including members of the Grand Secretariat, the highest institution of the Ming Dynasty, and even other eunuchs made a general plea to the Emperor to remove them from power. Emperor Zhangde, however, refused to punish the Eight Tigers. Subsequently, their power was confirmed and many court officials resigned. Tyrannical Liu Jin, head of the Eight Tigers, organised a eunuch's revenge on the officials, by ensuring demotions, stripping of all titles, or even torture and assassination. As his reign of terror continued, an outraged prince of the imperial family even launched a rebellion which would turn out unsuccessful due to the eunuch's control over the army. Liu Jin's thirst for power would however also be his demise, as it led to internal strife within the Eight Tigers. A jealous rival eunuch exposed to Emperor Zhangde Liu's alleged plans to assassinate him in order to place his own grandnephew on the throne. Convinced, the Emperor had Liu Jin arrested and sentenced to Lingchi, the infamous death by a thousand cuts, an execution that reportedly lasted for three days until the head tiger finally succumbed. The remaining seven tigers kept significant power until Zhang De's death in 1521 after which they were purged from government. Liu Jin would however not be the most powerful eunuch in the history of China. About a century after the Eight Tigers' rule, Prince Zhu Youjiao was enthroned in 1620 as Emperor Tianqi at 15 years old. The teenage monarch was notoriously illiterate, probably due to a learning disability, and further grew to be uninterested in state affairs, preferring to work on carpentry and woodwork projects instead. Subsequently, his trusted wet nurse, Madame Ke, and a eunuch named Wei Zhongxiang were able to use their influence over him to acquire power. They promptly purged their opponents, strengthening their position to the point of near unchallenged rule. A powerful Confucian faction of the court pleaded Emperor Tianqi to remove Wei Zhongxiang from power, accusing him of many heinous crimes. Just as it had been the case with Emperor Zhangde, the officials were unable to convince the emperor, and the eunuch and wet nurse's power was consolidated. As a purge and demonstration to other officials, Wei Zhongxiang then had the leaders of the faction tortured to death. The eunuch's uncontested rule as a virtual emperor would go on for practically a decade, during which he would amass spectacular wealth and power, and even have temples honouring him built across the country. Powerless Emperor Tianxi died without an heir in 1627, leading to his brother Zhu Youjian to be enthroned as Emperor Chongzhen. The new leader immediately received memorials from dozens and dozens of officials requesting the eunuch's immediate removal from power. Eventually, Chongzhen grew the confidence to have Wei Zhongxiang stripped from all his titles, who would soon take his own life rather than face further punishment.
Emperor Chongzhen would be the final monarch of the Ming Dynasty to rule in Beijing, as it was overthrown and replaced by the Manchu invaders of the Qing Dynasty in 1644. At the collapse of the Ming, about 70,000 palace eunuchs were left in the Forbidden City. The Manchus, however, with their own customs and way of ruling, and aware of the trouble caused by eunuchs throughout a lot of the Ming Dynasty, profoundly distrusted them. The Qing authorities, headed by Dorgon, child Emperor Shunzhe's uncle and regent, severely cut down the number of palace eunuchs to only about 1,000. Their role was also reduced to simple manual labour, far from political positions. Nonetheless, Dorgon died in 1650, reportedly of a hunting accident. Rivals of his faction in the court subsequently sought to destroy his influence and gradually transfer power to teenage Emperor Shunzhi. In this power struggle, palace eunuchs, headed by Wu Liangfu, were able to reclaim some power by participating in the destruction of Dorgon's faction, and Emperor Shunzhi was able to take over the government. The young monarch would thereafter trust eunuchs quite deeply, and Wu Liangfu became his favourite advisor. The eunuch convinced Emperor Shunzhi to establish the 13 offices, political offices run entirely by eunuchs, rather than Manchu officials. This rebound in eunuch influence over court politics would have not last long. After Shunzhi's premature death in 1661, Wu Liangfu was purged and the 13 officers disbanded. Once again, eunuchs became little more than servants in the palace, their lives one of submission and servitude. There was, however, one exception. As the following Qing emperors became profoundly involved with Tibetan Buddhism, the exceptional position of eunuch lama was created, and 18 eunuch lamas would thereafter serve in the Forbidden City, essentially acting as the imperial household's private priests, a privileged and envied position. Nonetheless, the Qing took no chances with palace eunuchs. Their conditions, although good, depended on absolute obedience for decades until potentially being granted retirement. On the event of a eunuch escaping from the Forbidden City, he would be sentenced to two months' imprisonment and the beating of twenty blows. A second desertion would see the eunuch placed in the uncomfortable Kang for two months straight. Finally, third-time deserters were banished to Mukden, the capital of Manchuria, for harsh service during two years and a half before their return to work in Beijing. Other offences, such as neglect of duty, would result in heavy beatings in two sessions separated by three days, causing extreme pain. However, if a eunuch was found guilty of such crimes as theft of an object personally belonging to the emperor, he would be immediately sentenced to death by public beheading. During the reign of Emperor Qianlong, in the golden age of the Haiqing era, the Forbidden City became a particularly vibrant palace. Subsequently, the number of palace eunuchs was raised to 3100 around the year 1750 to cater to its functioning, its peak during the Qing dynasty. After this date, as the dynasty would gradually decay, the number of palace eunuchs slowly dwindled. The nation faltered significantly during the 19th century, a period during which prominent eunuchs became infamously corrupt and more powerful. In 1861, Empress Dowager Cixi seized power in a time of great chaos. As a woman, despite being in control of the nation, she could technically not access all parts of the Forbidden City. Therefore, to run the complex and oversee everything within, Cixi began using a network of eunuchs which became her ears, eyes and hands. An Dehai, the chief eunuch, developed a strong personal relation with the Empress Dowager, and was subsequently entrusted with a lot of power. He was sent on a mission to Nanjing in 1869, during which he travelled with a public display of imperial authority, and supposedly extorted local officials along the way. An Dehai was however arrested by Ding Baozhen, the governor of Shandong province, and publicly executed in a power struggle between the Empress Dowager and Yi Xin, the Prince Gong, her ally turned rival. From then on, one final prominent eunuch of the history of China would emerge. With Anda Hai gone, the position of chief eunuch had become vacant. One powerless eunuch, named Li Lianying, cunningly studied hairdressing, soon becoming an expert, 
and was subsequently selected by the Empress Dowager as her personal hairdresser. Through his talent and ability to entertain Cixi in conversation, he soon became her favourite eunuch. Li Lianying's official position and closeness to the Empress Dowager allowed him to act as intermediate between officials wishing to speak to her privately. Subsequently, he received many bribes in return for putting in good words and granting them privileges with the Empress Dowager, or within the Forbidden City in general. After Cixi's death in 1908, Li Lianying received permission to retire and live the rest of his life in great luxury. Although palace life remained seemingly unchanged, the Qing dynasty, which had become backwards and hated by its population, was by then on the verge of collapse. In 1911, the Xinhai Revolution took place, which led to the abdication of six-year-old Emperor Pu Yi in early 1912. The millennia-old imperial system gave way to the Republic of China. The terms of the abdication however allowed the monarch and the imperial court to remain within the Forbidden City, although no longer holding actual political power. Disregarding the Republic's new laws, the imperial court continued to occasionally recruit eunuchs in the Forbidden City. Their number was by now only a third of what it had been during the Haixing era. One such recruit was Sun Yaoting, who was to be the last imperial eunuch in the history of China. The son of a destitute family, he had been castrated at home in 1911 at eight years old in the hopes of him becoming a palace eunuch. In 1917, 15-year-old Sun Yaoting successfully found employment in the Forbidden City. By then, with the child emperor powerless and the last prominent figures of the imperial courts dying or retiring, palace eunuchs' respect of authority began to disappear. To enrich themselves, eunuchs started stealing artifacts and furniture of the Forbidden City accumulated during the past six centuries to sell them on the markets of Beijing. As a result, teenage Emperor Pu Yi, advised by his Scottish tutor Sir Reginald Fleming Johnston, ordered an inventory of the Forbidden City's collections to be made to monitor and prevent theft. However, the eunuchs set fire to the palace hosting the inventory in 1923 to cover up their crimes. Outraged, the 18-year-old monarch decided to expel practically every single eunuch remaining in the Forbidden City, in a massive event that left a thousand of them on the streets of Beijing to fend for themselves. Only a few dozen trusted palace eunuchs were allowed to remain for maintenance, including Sun Yaoting. Nonetheless, most areas of the Forbidden City had to be closed down, as there was simply not enough staff to keep them open. The following year, the imperial court was evicted from the Forbidden City by General Feng Yuxiang in the midst of the warlord era. Most of the remaining eunuchs would thereafter return to civilian life, with a tiny fraction remaining in service of the court in exile. Although Pu Yi was restored as a puppet emperor by the Japanese in Manchuria in the 1930s, only a negligible number of former eunuchs, briefly including Sun Yaoting, would serve in his court, which would be disbanded in 1945. Outliving all his colleagues, Sun Yaoting, the last imperial eunuch, made a final visit to the Forbidden City in 1995. <laughs> Sun Yaoting died the following year, aged 94 years old. With his death, an immemorial system of China ended. Despite being mostly powerless and ill-reputed throughout history, Chinese eunuchs were occasionally able to strongly influence politics of the empire, or even seize complete control. Their role in imperial China as the closest figures to the imperial household undoubtedly shaped the very course of history. Thank you for watching my video, I hope you enjoyed it. If so, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions or requests, feel free to leave them in the comments section below.